Hello everybody and welcome to the Talking Crap Podcast. I am your host for today, Jazzy Josh Porter, and as always I'm joined by my co-host for today, the life coach Lucas Jackson. Hi, this feels really weird doing it the other way around, I but know. <laughs> it is your episode, so you know. I know it's weird, isn't it? I've got an episode for once. <laughs> um, how are you, Lucas? Yeah, I'm well, thanks, Josh. I'm well. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a heat wave, though, aren't we, in the, in the United Kingdom? Oh, and um, um, it's... <laughs> yeah, sorry in advance if you can hear the fan in the background, but there was no way I was doing this podcast without it. I think I'm more sorry <laughs> if they can hear the, my sweat dripping on the, on the <laughs> my iPad speaker at the moment. It's so bloody hot. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, if only I could animate that for the, for the video. <laughs> um, so, today's episode, we're looking at TNA and Impact Wrestling, hence I... I'm the one that's hosting today because I am the resident expert in all things TNA. Um, we've looked at it and we're probably, fingers crossed, might be doing a second episode on it, along with some of our upper topics in Season 2. Oh, and on the topic of Season 2, this is Episode 9, which means next week is our season finale. Ooh. We, I know. Ooh. Um, is it R or U? Like, do we get excited or do we get depressed because it's the last one? <laughs> well, it, it's the last of the series. It's not the last, last one, one for ever. a while. No. Like, it's yeah. gonna be, it's gonna be weird being out of this routine. Like, what am I gonna edit now? I'll tell you what I'll edit. <laughs> uh, but look, I, the, the, the viewpoint still continues though. We still have the viewpoint, yeah, and we still have bits and pieces on, on the Facebook page and on social media, and that maybe some little clips. But obviously, episode wise, we're taking a little break. Yeah, and also this coming Monday, I realise I announced this wrong last week. <laughs> I told you this Monday, it's the next Monday, um, is the first episode of Jazzy Josh's Indie Company of the Week, or Indie Promotion of the Week, um, and it, it's it's dead simple, it's literally just me talking about my favourite indie promotions across the globe, and I, I don't mean just the UK, the US, I mean the globe, like Australia, Greece, Europe, the rest of the Mediterranean, like yeah. everywhere yeah this would be a good good intake i think you got some good yeah. insights from things and it'd be something which we, while we can't cover maybe a, a major episode talking crap it'd be something like obviously we can do obviously as and when and obviously if people like this stuff let us know you know we need people to interact you know that's the thing with these things um interact talk to us know. yeah talk to us <laughs> we get loads of anyway, <laughs> anthony got some news for us josh yeah yeah so the the first news article up is an interesting one um, so Nia Jax has killed Charlotte Flair. Uh, God. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's, it's a storyline injury that they've given her in a match with Nia Jax, which is possibly the worst person you could have given a storyline injury to. Cause yeah, especially around this time. She's known for genuinely killing people in the... Well, not killing people, but genuinely injuring people during her matches. No, um, Charlotte Flair is going to be out for about eight months uh, for surgery and to take a personal break apparently and be back for she should be back for the royal rumble next year but she's taking an extended break due to surgery uh so yeah the 34 year old which is mad because she looks 64 yeah <laughs> she, she's been basically a constant mainstay in the promotion since 2012 when she first signed up um but she supposedly injured her arm during a match with Nia Jax on a recent raw i think i believe it was mm. But yeah, so she's been handled. She was given a title shot with Asuka again recently yeah. on a Monday Night Raw, which she lost. Um, Asuka got a submission win as usual, but during her post fight interview with Flair, um, she was attacked during her. No, that's wrong. During her post match interview, she was attacked by Nia Jax, who targeted her weaker arm, bizarrely slamming it with an oddly placed bin lid. Convenient, I know. <laughs> yeah. But, so, according to Talksport, uh, it's unlikely to feature in the ring again. In t she's unlikely to be in the ring again in 2020. There's a zero percent chance Charlotte's return for SummerSlam. So yeah, she's expected to be fit again around September. However, having been such a constant feature of the promotion, it, I wouldn't mind a little bit of time off. Yeah. Her shoved down her throat. <laughs> yeah, I think that statistic they put out at Takeover where they said that she had something like sixty-five 
championship matches and you're sat there just thinking fuck me there's like a massive roster of women and we talked about in a yeah. women's episode if you please check that out on the uh, youtube channel like in the women's, there's exactly. so many women now in Daddy Bree are just so phenomenal and just the fact that this you know this one charlotte has been given that many opportunities i think yeah she needs she needs a break from us from wrestling and we need a break from her and i think yeah like if that is the case um obviously it does seem like it very much is a storyline thing so it is a case where she could come back before um you know, she could even go part time for a little bit. You know, I think as well maybe. the situation in the world of the concert of the world, um, that's probably you know maybe now, swaying that's, that's a little bit too. Recently ravaged WWE as well. This current situation in the world. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think it's it's the right time really. Other women can shine. Like she's done. You know, yeah, other women can shine. Yeah. And when she's ready, she can come back hmm. and um, you know do a good job again. You know, she's still a, one of the figureheads of the division really, and she's never going to yeah. be. Yeah, she's always going to be featured, but I think it's time maybe to have a few months off. Unfortunately, she'll be on the Mount Rushmore of women's wrestling. Um, But yeah, it is believed that, well, supposedly Asuka was meant to be the one to inflict the injury, air quotes, I realise you can't see that now, uh, to (laughs) allow her to take the time off for her surgery. Um, I can't actually find what surgery it is she needs, but there's meant to be some form of surgery. Um, So another women's wrestler that's taking a break from professional wrestling is that of former WWE uh, superstar and former member of the Riot Squad, Sarah Logan. Yeah. Which which is a shame, because she was fantastic. Like, they... WWE... My issue with WWE is they've got so many people on their roster that they don't recognise some of the small hidden gems they have. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we discussed as many times, I mean, like I said, in that women's episode, we discussed lots oh, yeah. of them. Um, but yeah, I think this again might be forced for the situation in the world. Like, obviously, there's not that much wrestling running. Um, and she might just want some time to kind of, you know, take some time to herself and kind of reassess things. And I mean, there is obviously always the opportunity that WWE do reach out to these people again like once things are a bit better because they will need house show workers when and if house show return they're gonna need so, Helen fodder yeah and essentially. you know she, she 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 did a good job particularly in the last couple of months um with stuff she did with shana baszler um who's also seemed to disappear recently um but um yeah hopefully you know she she figures it out and she comes back perhaps she goes to impact or for Perhaps she just yeah. toured the Indies, but I, I kind of see her going back. back to WWE eventually, to be fair. Um, just maybe she wants some time off now because of the situation in the world. Well, yeah, I, I've got a little quick bit here. So she was part of the group of people released back in April, which is ridiculous. Uh, so, yeah, any 90-day no-compete clause that she might be under would be up next month. So but mm. we, we can't expect her to show up in any other wrestling promotions on TV at the moment, because obviously current situation in the world, but she has actually released a short statement saying a lot has changed in my life recently and I've stepped away from the rest. I've stepped away from wrestling for the foreseeable future. Um, she carries on to say wrestling is all I've known since I was 17. So it's time that I let myself focus on other things and explore other parts of myself. So yeah, like, yeah, she, she's 26, that. she's got the rest of her life ahead of her. She's also got a YouTube channel, uh, Wild and Free, which I'll post a link to down below, because maybe she'll share us back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, she's also said that my efforts have been on the Wild and Free TV, the YouTube channel, and that's the best way to keep up. We're releasing some awesome content. I did. I don't say this enough. I appreciate you guys and hope to see you down the line. So that's kind of teasing she might come back, but it's also saying don't get your hopes up kind of thing. Yeah, I think that, that's, that's respectable in the, in the, in, under these yeah. circumstances. Like I said, she, 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 she's young and she can come back and do some great things in the future. She's got plenty of time. Indeed. Um, so yeah, like the, the last bit, we'll, we'll try and make this brief, but this is, this is the last one and it makes sense considering the episode. And that is that Impact Wrestling have been teasing recently the re- potential return of Aces and Eights. Um, this is something we need to mention if we do another episode of TNA and Impact Wrestling because I remember I, I I haven't got that in the notes for this episode, but hey ho, there's, yeah. there's enough there for another full episode if we want to. If you well, yeah, guys I mean, want that, yeah, I mean obviously they they were a massive stable and a massive 
kind of thing. I guess the reveals weren't the best, um, <laughs> <laughs> to put it lightly. And that is something had. which I guess we will have to discuss, obviously, in the yeah. future. But I think if they are coming back, I think, you know, I'm hoping that people who are negative towards these kind of things um, just grow the fuck up, really, because, you know, we're at the stage where, you know, WWE brought back Evolution. They, they you know, they, yeah. they brought back several different things from the past, and we've... We've had varying success with them, let's be honest. Um, and if TNA want to do it, Impact want to do it, then mm. like so be it. And, you know, potentially it could be a new... I, I always see a stable as like it could make someone. That's how I always see them, you know, because obviously out of DX, we got Triple H, you know, and out of like the NWO, we had like... Well, they already really made really, but we had, you know, we had all, all sorts of people, you know. So I think there is still that case of like, Someone could be made from this table. You know, Evolution gave us like Batista, Randy Orton, who yeah. then went on to become massive main event players, you know, for the company for many years to come. So Fortune 4 gave us AJ Styles, Frankie Kazarian and Christopher hmm. Daniels. Yes, yeah. um, yeah, basically, I think I think this could be good. I'm willing to see where this goes. I think Impact does seem like it's on the rebirth and it's something which we probably can discuss more as the episode goes on. Hmm. But yeah, like, the main issue I had with Aces and Eights is they didn't, they used either people that we already knew or they used people we'd never heard of before. Wes Briscoe, Garrett Bischoff, for example, mm. and some other randos. Although we did have Doc Gallows, uh, recently yeah. Luke Gallows. Yeah, I mean, obviously they're teasing going back to Impact too. Exactly. But so I think, yeah, Aces and Eights... have them. Yeah, potentially. Um, it, you know, it could be a star vehicle for one of them, perhaps. Um, one Maybe. of the former the debris guys. But it's, it's something which... Um, Obviously, we shall see as it develops, I think. Maybe, but yeah, um, they, they started off with D'Lo Brown having, like, his Aces and Eights cut on the back of his chair. Mm. And he was on a phone call to someone. So who knows? Um, but yeah, that is everything we have time for for the news. We've gone a little over time, so we will carry on with the thicket that is TNA and Impact Wrestling with Mr. Lewis Barrett. So, obviously, we're discussing Impact Wrestling slash TNA, and in and in doing so, we have brought in a very good friend of ours. Um, he's basically the reason I get to all my wrestling events, because I don't drive, but he does. Um, that is former DKW Showcase and Chaos Champion, Lewis Barrett. What's going on, everyone? How are we? Hope we're all staying safe. Yeah, yeah, we're doing well. Um, Lucas, how are you? Yeah, all good, all good. good you good. also forgot, Josh, that I was Sorry. a former Cruiserweight champion. I was and Chaos too. That, but, I've mentioned Chaos, uh, I was thinking Cruiserweight, but seeing as that's now the Showcase Championship, I didn't really feel like mentioning it. <laughs> but then having said that, in my world, you know, that weight class doesn't exist anymore. True, this is true, considering most wrestlers are now Cruiserweights. Um... So and the fact I'm also the leader of all heavyweights going. Yeah. Again, also <laughs> true. <laughs> you are the heavyweight after all. Uh, that being said, let's go straight into the Pipe Bomb Challenge. Wait, what? The Pipe Bomb Challenge. The Pipe Bomb Promo Challenge. It's actually very simple. Um, I say it's very simple and everyone seems to trip over it. So, the way this is going to work is I'm going to give you two topics, one being a place slash show and one being a championship, well, maybe a championship and a competitor or two. Um, so, okay. do you understand the rules? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good, that's the reaction yes. I always like. Um, you'll be scored out of 10 points, yeah. 5 by me, 5 point losers, so you, you, you've got a decent chance. Um, and you uh, have one minute to do so. Your two topics are you will be at Destination X, one of TNA's pay-per-views. For the yes. X Division Championship, you'll be facing AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels and Kazarian in an Ultimate X match. Your one minute <laughs> starts now. Destination X, pay-per-view on the 18th of June 2020. The Destination X pay-per-view main event, the Ultimate X match, featuring the phenomenal AJ Styles, the Fallen Angel, Christopher Daniels, and, well, Chris Daniels is, you know, 
little brother, Frankie Kazarian. Now, for the X Division Championship, this means a lot to the whole division because this is the championship that come the main events of Destination X, you can perhaps even vacate the championship to ultimately go for the world championship. Now, here's what I feel as the leader of the heavyweight division. I am going to not mess around with crawling along those ropes. That's for the, that's for the, the skinny, flippy kids. I'm going to just grab that ladder, pull that title down. I'm going to vacate that title straight away and challenge for that world heavyweight championship to validate the word heavyweight. And all will be right in the world because the current champion being, I believe, is Austin Aries. Again, you know, skinny little vegan. Here's my. Th- this is now my time <laughs> to do so. Oh, okay. Very well done. You did go a fair bit over time. About 30 oh, right. seconds, oh. I believe. Oh. I did mention the right. minute rule. However, that being said, you did get all your points across. Um, and you mentioned option C in there, which yeah, we'll be mentioning yeah. later on. But you, you, you got in the option C point, which is a nice yeah. touch, uh, trying to validate the heavyweights. Um, so if we're excluding, not excluding, but taking into consideration that the little time issue, I will give you okay. uh, three and a half. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I'm, uh, I have been a n- nightmare for promos for a long time. My problem was not having enough to say. So it's actually now a nice, it's actually now nice to actually hear like, oh, I'm actually now delivering probably too much con- content now. I know I tailed off towards the end there, but it was one of those where like I needed to think of the smaller heavyweight champions they've had. Yeah. And, it, and I knew I was kind of going over, so I kind of had to sign off. But, oh, but thank you so much. Three and a half. Okay. No worries. Lucas, what's your score? Oh, I popped massively for the skinny vegan line. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, probably the highlight of the program. The reason why I said that was because um, that was a Jim Cornette thing. Yeah, I thought it did sound very Cornette-ish or around the time of, you know, when Triple H and Kevin Nash recording CM Punk, you know, skinny fat or whatever. But um, I quite enjoyed it, like um, some of the stuff. <laughs> I quite enjoyed it. That that popped me a lot. Obviously, it did go over, which you'd like to say is odd um, for you. But yeah, I, I agree with Josh. Three and a half. Three and a half solid effort. Yeah, so at the end of that, you've got a solid seven points, which puts you second place. Behind who? Sam Dufresne, um, Vinnie Daniels and Champagne Charlie all have eight points. Okay, okay. So, you didn't come last. <laughs> no, you didn't come last. Um, because I think last was what? Six? Yeah, I think six. Yeah. yeah. No, that's some very good was. promos. Yeah, that's some good promos out this, this series. Oh, yeah. Fair. I mean, they were all good. They just kind of all went over time. Right. Anyway, that being said, let's move on to today's topic. <laughs> Um, we've got mate, a, a, as brief a history to start with as I can. We're trying not to do a history lesson here because I know sometimes you go off tensions like that. But um, it actually kind of started in a weird way. Jeff Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett, and Bob Ryder went fishing. It's starting to sound like a one-liner, isn't it? A joke. Um, but yeah, they, they, they were contemplating their future within the wrestling business. So they go to. Um, a TV, like some TV broadcaster, I don't know exactly which one, and they pitched this idea of an edgier promotion than WWE, where rather than having weekly episodic programs, they'd have weekly pay-per-view shows, that being under the TNA NWA moniker, and the, the TNA name actually came from Vince Russo, who was one of the writers, and it's a playoff of Test and Albert's tag team in WWE, T and A. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. It, it was a little playoff of their, of their tag team name. So, June 19th, 2002 comes around, their first show airs, and during a dark match, a wrestler, 450 pounds, named Cheeks, run, hits the ropes during one of, during his match, 
and actually breaks one of the ropes, <laughs> which is hardly ideal. And so they're sitting there thinking, what do we do now? Because it's going to take like 30 minutes to an hour to fix it. So they shift their schedule around to focus mainly on promos and in-ring interviews or just backstage interviews so they'd have time to fix it. Luckily they got it fixed in time and the show went on as planned. Um, so TNA's first shows were all held at what's called the TNA Asylum in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's really from there where it all kicked off as TNA because they originally had their partnership with NWA. So my question is, Lewis, what was your first TNA match you watched? My first TNA match? Um, so, like, as, like, it's kind of a just skimming through uh, YouTube kind of thing, uh, my earliest memory would be a triple threat tag match, and this was Chris Saban's debut. He tagged with Johnny Storm. Um, Johnny Storm was one of the, well, he is the first British-born uh, TNA wrestlers I ever, I ever, I ever, ever clapped eyes on. The first guy I ever saw, British guy I ever saw on TV was Regal, but the first thing I was in the TNA days was Johnny Storm. Hmm. Uh, and this was Chris Saban, maybe, as I say. I think he was only 22 at the time. Um, yeah, it was quite it was them, the first time TNA. Yeah, it was them, the motorcycle machine guns, and I cannot remember the, the last thing. It might have been Elix Skipper, maybe. Hmm. And Daniels, perhaps. Um, and that, at the time, they were really innovating that. The, 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 the style we see nowadays, particularly you know, that, that Ring of Honor, the independent style back. Like they were the first time I saw especially in 2002, around that time. Yeah. Um, now, I started now, I started really watching uh, TNA um, also around the 2007 fight, Mark, so I know we're going to be talking about that, as that was one of the hottest series they ever had. And obviously, and this campaign was so great. Out of the uh, again. Sorry, you seem to be cutting out a bit there. What, what bit did you miss? Uh, or what did you get up to? Tear him out a bit. Um, it's like halfway through, whatever you said. Yeah. We got 2007. So like 2007, you probably started watching it, and then it kind of, I kind of lost it from there. All right. Okay. 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 So Bear with me then. Two seconds. Let me just see if I can up the connection. There we go. That should do it. Right. That should hopefully help with the connection issues. Okay. Right, so if you want to start so, from 2007 again. Yeah, cool. Uh, so for me, and then when it came to, I started watching it again around 2007 mark, as we will discuss later on in the show, as that was one of the more hotter eras uh, in, and most successful eras uh, in, in the company's history. Yeah. Because um, Kurt Angle's um, quite an buzz so still so hot because he had, had such an, an incredible run with WWE up until that point. Um, and then when I got into this myself in 2013, that's when I started watching it almost every week as me, as a student of the game, trying to learn and you know, know the level that, that, hmm. that I do. Uh, for me, just TV content was the best thing. Yeah, you're cutting out again. Uh, yeah, okay. Don't know what's happening there, but you seem to be cutting out again. Um, right. Do you want me to use my phone or something instead of my computer? Perfect. Right. Um, so, Lewis, now that we've had a quick look at TNA's kind of history or the formation, I'm curious, what's one of your favourite matches that you can remember from TNA? Uh, okay, so more, what I, think, I think undisputed number one would be the triple threat match between uh, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, and Chris Daniels. Um, that's like the undisputed number one. I think it's still to this day the only five star match in the company's history, I believe. Indeed, 
Um, that match was actually rated five stars by Meltzer himself, and it was actually at their first uh, monthly pay-per-view event after the formation of uh, Explosion being their first cable TV broadcasted show, and then not long after they started Impact in 2004 with the six-sided ring, and now that you've mentioned such a important X Division match in their history, you might as well focus on the X Division while we're here. So yeah, as you mentioned, you've got AJ Styles versus Christopher Daniels versus Samoa Joe on September 11th, 2005 for the X Division title at their first monthly pay-per-view, Unbreakable. Um, as said, yes, it is today the only five-star match that they have in the history of Impact and TNA. That's mad. I know, yeah. it's insane. That it's the you can see five-star it, match they yeah. have. You can see the talent they they they've always been able to always attract as well. Makes oh, you yeah. wonder why why it is just that really. Yeah, so just if we focus on the X division, obviously it started off with the NWA X title, and later down the line became the TNA X division championship, which is still around now. But it started off as people looked at it as a cruiserweight division when it really wasn't. Because the, the whole tagline for it was it's not about weight limits, it's about no limits. However, they have in the past brought in weight limits for it. And at one point it was solely about having triple threat matches and weight limits. But it, it was really derived from the high-flying, high-risk style of wrestling that was featured on WCW and, and ECW in the, late in the late 90s. But... They emphasised on the fact that most of the performers who who worked for this style were under 220 pounds. But obviously, you had Samoa Joe, Abyss, people like that that were definitely not 220 pounds. But by calling it a cruiserweight division, it kind of took away from what it actually was. So, looking at the exhibition championship and the exhibition as a whole, they brought in quite a lot of stylized matches most notably one of my favorite stipulations ever the ultimate x match which you did your promo challenge on earlier and they've done that for a lot of things not just the title but tournaments as well so that being said if, do you know kind of any ultimate x matches that come to mind straight away that really blew you away oh um it would have to be, I believe it was the day that DJ Z won it. I think uh, one, one, uh, the title had been vacated by Lash, I believe. Um, and this was the division where it had Trevor Lee, DJ Z, um, I believe Crazy Steve the Clown, uh, amongst amongst others. And this is when, at this point, it was really now shifting back to being a, kind of more of a cruiserweight thing again. As you say, people like Joe and Abyss who had it, they were still such cornerstones of the company at that time. Um, it was one of those where, again, the, the, they were able to work that style, though, um, despite, obviously, that you know being a bit bigger. Um, the reason why I say this one is because, at this point, um, DJ Z had, at this point, like nearly died. Um, he, he took a 450 at a AAA match, and it just crushed his ribs and nearly died. He was in hospital in, in intensive care. And for him, it was when it, it was a big redemption story for him to um, not just not just work to get back in the ring. It was like, no, now I want to hit a stride where he was way better because he even said himself the reason why he almost died was because he was getting a bit complacent um, because it, obviously he's a bit frustrated with, the, with his spot in the card. Um, and the reason why this match stuck out as well is because it was a very unconventional way of actually winning the title where um, the belt had been unhooked by two people and they were fighting over it. He springboarded in and snatched it whilst the belt was in between two people, you know, in the clutch of two people. Um, that's what stuck to me. The reason why, because the I had broken into the business about 2013 myself. And when I started, I was that plucky underdog cruiserweight. So seeing a different style and presentation for that kind of style, it just it drew me in straight away. Hmm. So now that we've had Lewis, is Lucas, do you want to kind of bring in a little bit of your insight on the Ultimate X match or just the exhibition as a whole. I've always said this, that the two strongest points that I feel Impact have had has been the women and the X division. 
And whenever they've tried to put limits on the X division, such as weight limits or triple threat stipulations, no one's liked it because the whole thing is that it's a very exciting division. And I feel that they, when used and done correctly, it can be the centrepiece or like a big attraction piece and a reason to watch um, their promotion over a another. I mean, it reminds me a lot of the WCW, like it, what a continuation of the WCW Cruiserweight division would have been like. Because obviously, WWE, they got rid of essentially the a lot of the uh, cruiserweights and then they, re they redid it and they finally gave them TV time. And it kind of got better once Rey Mysterio hit in 2002. But they never took the division too seriously for a long period of time, especially once Rey obviously were moved up to becoming world champion. But TNA, I felt the X division was a very strong continuation point. But looking at the stuff WCW are doing with like Free Count and um, the young, uh, the young Bloods, wasn't it? The um, yeah. feel like that back in the two thousands, back in the or in the year two thousand, they were always having like you know ladder matches and um, double ladder matches, table matches, all this kind of stuff. And I think this was a natural progression for it. I do think that some of the bigger guys in there, like Lashley, Samoa Joe, Abyss, they've always helped the division. I think, but. I would say that it is one of those things now where Cruiserweight is more of a um, style, not just a weight limit. Because yeah. I think if, say, Keith Lee was in TNA, I think he would absolutely destroy the, the X division. And he'd, he'd make a lot of money um, being involved in that division, as well as a lot of money in the world title division. Don't well, get me wrong with that. Funny you mention Keith Lee, because the current X division champion is of a very similar stature and style to Keith Lee, that being Willie Mack. Um, yeah. He won the title, I believe, off of uh, Ace Austin not too long ago. And he hasn't defended it in a while, but... Yeah, that, that being said, you mentioning Keith Lee, we do currently have a guy of his size and style in the form of Willie Mack. But one of the... Um, one of the more unorthodox match styles in the X Division was that of the Elevated X match. There were only a few, a very, very small amount of these matches, because it was a very bizarre style, but essentially the Elevated X match was, there were normally two people on an X-shaped structure high above the ring, and they would compete yeah, against each other to throw each other off of the platform. Yeah, almost like a scaffolding kind of match, kind of thing. Yeah, but it's safer. Well, safer is a strong word for that. But the first one being Rhino versus AJ Styles. Um, okay. So yeah, we've mentioned the X Division, how this really being one of the cornerstones or corner pillars of TNA as a whole, along with the Knockouts Division which is still going strong, and I would arguably say it was one of the original women's revolutions or evolutions in wrestling today. But that, that being said, um, we could maybe look at one of, not TNA's downfalls, but one of their, shall we say, mistakes, that being hiring in 2013, not 2013, 2010, Hiring Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff to work as writers and creative guys in TNA. They made a lot of changes. One of those being they moved the show to Monday nights, which was directly opposite Monday Night Raw, which definitely did not help them in any way possible because we did not need another Monday Night Wars after we saw how well Eric Bischoff did with WCW with that. And they also got rid of the six-sided ring, which, for a fan's perspective, was the worst thing they could have done. But for a wrestler's perspective, it was the best thing they could have done, because a lot of wrestlers in TNA have come out and said they hated the six-sided ring. And I understand yeah. why, because you'll be training in a four-sided ring for years, and then suddenly go, uh, what the hell is that? I, I've always hated six-sided rings. I mean, deadly yeah. honest. I think, I think I can see the attraction, and I think they could still use it as an attraction. Like if they did, um, 
they did the pay if they did like you know the Ultimate X matches or their um, Six Hundred Steel as like a one-off event every year, I, I think people be down with that. But I think in terms of wrestling, it, it's for it, the ring is for is for is for sides in my opinion. Yeah. So uh, I think that was the one change that was good. Yes, yeah, so I know there's a lot of uh, Mexican uh, promotions that use a six-sided ring, but I I presume that they probably train with a six-sided ring as well. Um. But yeah, that being said, not only did they bring in Hogan and Bischoff, but Hogan and Bischoff also brought along with them some of the favourites from WWE, being RVD, Ric Flair, Jeff Hardy, and Mr. Anderson, formerly known as Mr. Uh, Mr. Kennedy. Um, Hardy and Anderson both being main eventers of Bound for Glory. Um, so that being said, you're also looking at some of the not-so fortunate moments, that being the feud between the faction Immortal, which was Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff's faction, against Ric Flair's faction being Fortune 4. Now, this rivalry all culminated and ended up in a lethal lockdown match, but you mentioned Six Sides of Steel, so let's also mention Lethal Lockdown, one of the most innovative cage matches they've ever done. Um, the way this worked was they'd have a cage and wrestlers from each team would come in at intervals and eventually... Wasn't it, wasn't it their answer to the chamber, wasn't it? I think? Yeah, essentially it was their version of an elimination chamber, but no one was eliminated. It was all... you came Can't in tell, like War, war Games as well. Yeah, very similar to War Games at the same time where you come in at interview, intervals and you couldn't perform a pinfall submission. The match could not end until everyone was in the ring, well, in the cage, and the cage roof so that's would be lowered. Um, yeah, with a roof. Yeah. And one ring. But mm. this being said, quite a lot of kind of faction wars ended in the lethal lockdown. And one of my favourite moments being uh, AJ Styles jumping from the rafters and putting, I think it was James Storm or someone else through a table to end the match with a pin. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So that being said, um, what do you guys think of this whole lethal lockdown situation? Should they bring it back? Should they keep it? Or should they keep it in the in, in, undercovers kind of thing? Uh, I, I'm with Lucas on this. I like the... I, I, in general, I think the ring should be four sides. Uh, but as an attraction, it did it did do a lot for them it, 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 on, on, on the positive side. Um the in terms of my experience of, like work, of working in a six-sided ring, uh, it's just it's ever so difficult. It particularly actually when you go to the top rope, because obviously the angle of the of the turnbuckles are a bit more obtuse. So obviously they're, they're greater than ninety degrees, and then the footing can be like really really difficult. Um, but if the, if the workers don't mind doing it um, as a one-off thing, I think I think everyone's everyone's down with it. Um, I think it also makes it a little bit more. Um, again, just more, just, just more niche, a bit more different from what's happening currently. Currently, as we, as we are sort of talking right now, it's make, is it creates a bit more of a niche to, um, just to stand out a little bit. Because at the moment, the the market for like live TV wrestling is actually very, very oversaturated at the minute. Yeah, mm. well, they they have brought back the six sided ring from time to time, mainly uh, um, yeah. their pay per views being one night only. Ironic, considering they were never one night only. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, they, they brought it back here and there, but they've never brought it back as a whole. Um, so if we skip a few years to 2013, you'll see that Hulk Hogan's contract expired and he buggered off back to WWE. Um, AJ yeah. Styles also left that same month. His contract also expired and he wasn't happy with what they offered him. So obviously now he's gone through the indie scenes again. He's held multiple championships in multiple promotions and now currently Intercontinental Champion in WWE. But... <laughs> didn't he... Didn't he have to take a pay cut of about... It was something... It was a really big uh, pay cut, wasn't it? Like 40%, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a mad pay cut. And he said, yeah. to be fair... To be fair to AJ here, I believe he said that if it had been, like, in line with everyone else, he would have taken it. But his biggest problem was it wasn't. It was just literally him and a couple of others that were singled out. And then everyone else's pay was kind of kept in line. But he kind of said, look, if everyone's getting a pay cut, I'll take a pay cut, which he was better for. But I think as well, he'd done the right thing, definitely, um, at that he time. He did the right thing for um, him, and it's obviously benefited him 
hand down. Um, yes. But the departures didn't end there for them. It was all downhill with departures. They had Jeff Jarrett resigning and going off to make GFW. They had Christopher Daniels, Sting. Um, who else? They had Christopher Daniels, Sting, Samojo, oh, I, 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 yeah. and a bunch of others leave straight after then. Um, but now that we've kind of mentioned the X Division and things like that, let's look at their equivalent to WrestleMania, that being Bound for Glory. So 2005 was the first Bound for Glory show, and that was in Orlando, Florida, in what they called the Impact Zone, which was basically their home for TNA. One year later, they had their first pay-per-view outside of the Impact Zone in Michigan, and that was, again, Bound for Glory. So... I've got here a list of main events. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to mention a few kind of, not special ones, but highlight ones for me. Uh, the first one being Jeff Jarrett versus Rhino for the TNA, for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship, because around that time was just before they got rid of the NWA Championship, a year later for the TNA Championship. But that was kind of the first time they used a former UFC champion in Tito Ortiz as a special guest referee. Yeah, I remember, I remember this angle, actually. Yeah, um, what what are your guys' kind of thoughts on the whole Bound for Glory situation? Like, what would you say was a highlight Bound for Glory match or a highlight Bound for Glory pay-per-view? Well, for me, I actually enjoyed the Bound for Glory series. It it, it created, again, that, that niche that, you know, that, that can build to the, the, the big payoff at the end of the year. It was nice, actually, that, again, not to be too in line with WWE, their, their Bound for Glory pay-per-view was October um, or around that kind of time. And it was nice to actually be like, instead of having like a Royal Rumble like WWE do to then build to and have like a two, three-month build to Mania, they had their equivalent where it's like, let's actually have like a big series and tournament and different kinds of stipulations and a point system. Um, and then they, and they, and again, you can work that way. Like, you know, maybe someone who's like struggling to start with and has a big run at the end, or the, the more main guys can like, you know, sort of hug the sort of the top, uh, you know, um, for a while, and then something can, can literally just, um, you know, just just change the course of things. Um, some things were a little bit silly though. Um, like they would put like a tag team in it, and whenever they face each other, that's when it. Then they booked it in a way where like. You know, they they did it so like I think Daniels and Kazarian like just, just they took a double count out each, so they only had a point each, so they didn't have to fight each other. Like that was a little bit silly. Yeah. Um, so it's but, always a bit off when they put tag teams in a match together. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of like it, although it was the coming, it it really was the the breaking ground for like Bobby Roode for his career, uh, the Bound for Glory series because. Um, the big angle and the big payoff being, well, the big angle being like, look, I'm, I've been a tag team guy my whole life. I, 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 you know, it's time to break out. And the training videos and the big interviews with like his family to really build up him winning the Bound for Glory series and going on to challenge. And the ultimate heel turn when he obviously smashed James Storm with, a, with the beer bottle to, to win the title in the end. In beer money. Yes, it was. And that to me, like that to me elevated Bobby Roode to like, you know, a, a, you know, the, the, one of the TNA made stars, like not yeah. really, not, not not a WWE guy coming over with buzz, more like an organically grown star, and um, and yeah, and his and his run with the title was absolutely fantastic. And it all was bit down for to, to ban, the Bamble Glory series and that pay per view. Yeah, um, he's at, the weird thing is he didn't actually face James Storm. At Bound for Glory. No, no, it was he Kurt faced, Angle, wasn't it? Yeah, he faced current, uh, the current world champion. Sh- sh- pe- 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 <laughs> sorry, the current world champion <laughs> at the time being in Kurt Angle, and that was yes. 2011, I believe. But the weird yes. thing is, Lucas, do you have it? Actually, before I move on, Lucas, do you have any memorable Bound for Glory moments that you'd like to give us? Um, I'll, well, I'll give you a take on what I think about the actual event itself. Um, I think it's smart. Something I've always, again, it's something I'd, I'd praise in A4 as well, is they found a way to be different. Because obviously I think every 
wrestling company out there will kind of copycat the Rumble to Mania kind of storyline because yeah. it's been done forever and forever. I think TNA having like Slammiversary in the summer, um, you know, which obviously celebrates their anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, they, if there's still people out there didn't know what that fucking meant. <laughs> um, and then you know, they've got Bound for Glory. It's like usually September, October, isn't it? I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's obviously in months where obviously Dudley Bree don't, don't have anything. Um, you know, well, they have m- normal pay per view, but don't have like one of the big five. Hmm. You know, or big four, whatever. However many we are now. Um, and so I think, yeah, like overall, Bound for Glory has produced good moments. And I think it's always interesting to see where we're kind of in the main event of Bound for Glory. They usually do have like a good year, like after doing so. So people like Kurt Angle, Bobby Roode, Samoa Joe, you know, Christopher Daniels, etc., who have been in that last spot, have then had like good success to come. So it is like a measuring stick, I'd say, for success in TNA. So I think it does its job in that respect. So, also, what I'd like to add, if that's okay, uh, one of my mo- more memorable moments was actually very recently the the, the main event, which was Austin Aries and John Mor- uh, sorry, not John Morrison, Johnny, Morris, Impact. Johnny Impact. Yes, uh, the reason we're asking Pell about that main event was because it was just two guys that just did not like each other, and they literally went out of their way to screw each other over in that main event. Yeah. And as a viewer watching it. It's just like that moment where it's just like, you know, you grab the popcorn and just, just watch it in full in front of your eyes, wasn't yeah. it? Um, and it was a lot of uh, shooting from the hip going into that and a, and a lot more backlash afterwards. Um, and it, well, it's especially like, on Aries. Oh, gee, wow, yeah. Um, and But that, uh, with Austin Aries, is one of, he's one of those guys where, like, he knows he's a super talented as well. And, and uh, it, to, to his own downfall... You know, was was the backlash from that from that event? But if anyone who hasn't watched that or seen or heard, uh, and you're listening to this now, I do it. Yeah, have, have a have a YouTube see what, and uh, and have a watch and just what we just watch the madness basically because it was one of the wildest wildest moments in professional wrestling history. Really, it was none, nothing something like that had never been done for yeah. years to that point. It's definitely one of those matches that you can't forget. But another one you can't forget is the only Bound for Glory where the World Championship wasn't in the main event. And that was in Tokyo, Japan, back in 2014, where the great Muta and Tajiri went up against James Storm and the great Sonada. Now, the reason that the championship wasn't defended in the main event was because a few weeks or a few days earlier... AJ Styles, I believe, or, yeah, no, AJ Styles had defended the World Championship the year before at a Japanese event for Wrestle 1. Okay. I'm just trying to remember if it was AJ Styles or not, because he definitely was this, Wrestle 1 before. Was so, this yeah. the time... Uh, to be honest, I didn't enjoy that 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 Bound for Glory because, as you said, there was not really much riding on it. It was very like a fun no. together mismatch pay per view. Um, and I believe at this time, were they not working the angle that Styles had taken the TNA title and was taking it abroad? Like that, because basically they wanted to copycat the CM Punk story where he walks yeah. away with the title. But they, but because they picked holes in, well, no, CM Punk should have actually should have defended it in Ring of Honor and New Japan. And they actually, then TNA went ahead to go, actually, we'll work that angle where we will actually let you um, defend it defend it abroad and we'll, we'll, we'll go pay-per-views without you so you can build up some more buzz. Yeah, because he wasn't contracted at that time with TNA because it, tw- it was December 2013 that he actually had his contract, which, well, ended. But that's the main reason that AJ didn't defend it Bound for Glory was because he didn't work for TNA, he just had their title. Um, so, Lucas, earlier on you mentioned Slammiversary, which is actually yeah. coming up very soon. I believe we'll have a Viewpoint episode on that. But Slammiversary yeah, essentially is the anniversary show for TNA, and some people hi- hold it in higher regard than Bound for Glory sometimes. And it, it sometimes yeah, it I guess... is a lot bigger. Yeah, I, I think the timing of it helps, I'd argue, I think. It being a summer show, usually... Um, and obviously, you know, people watching it probably at barbecues and at, you know, events or whatever. Um, and it tends to be at a time where, you know, 
WWE obviously usually have sp- a space out program between WrestleMania and SummerSlam. So we get big matches in March, April time and big matches in August time. So I think them popping up in June, July saying, oh, hello, we've got a big show now. It does them like a world of good, I'd argue. Yeah. So we won't focus too much on that now because we are getting close to running out of time. But we will look more into Impact Wrestling because GFW, Global Force Wrestling, Jeff Jarrett's new promotion after he left. Later on, Jarrett comes back to TNA and tries and miserably fails at merging Global Force with Impact Wrestling. So what, what was the deal with this? Like, did, did it, it got rebranded, didn't it? And didn't they change all the belts? Yeah, yes. Right, so basically, and ropes, everything. Yeah, Anthem Sports and Entertainment bought a majority stake in TNA. And later on, Jeff Jarrett comes in as well and goes, well, I'm going to buy Anthem. So he did. He buys Anthem, attempts to merge GFW and Impact Wrestling into Global Force Wrestling on its own, and it fails miserably. I don't know why, but it just does. No one likes it. They had the Global Force title and all the Global Force championships as opposed to the Impact championships. And everyone thought that was the end for TNA and Impact Wrestling as a whole. Oh, sorry, my time has just gone off. And thought that was the end of it as a whole. But it then hits 2018. Anthem has kind of kicked out Jeff Jarrett in a way. And brings in Don Callis and Scott Demore, who are still to this day the vice presidents of Impact Wrestling and are now in charge of everything that goes on. Um, and essentially, they flip the whole thing, and TNA is no longer. It's now Impact Wrestling. Nothing but Impact Wrestling. But they did have a short deal, I think they still do have a deal with Twitch the live streaming platform to host some on and off events, shall we say, for TNA. And they also have their weekly episodes on Twitch. And then that's that for TNA. TNA is now is no longer in Impact Wrestling is Impact Wrestling. Um, so let's, as I mentioned, the Knockouts Division earlier, let's kind of briefly go into that with a former Knockouts champion being Tessa Blanchard, daughter of Tully Blanchard and stepdaughter of Magnum TA, being the current TNA world champion or Impact Wrestling world champion, defending at Slammiversary soon. So, yeah. Lewis, I'm I know hoping... You... Sorry? Yeah, no, ask Lewis your question. So, Lewis, I know you have an opinion on women going for men's titles and vice versa so if you could just briefly give us your thoughts on that uh, this is it's a tough one because tessa is, is that good um but i, I still find it a little, a little bit weird a little strange maybe call me dated maybe but um it, it just in the modern in the modern wrestling fan, they they see the the women being treated as equals and it and it's great. But to, to the wider society, it just comes across a bit more phony. Um, it's a strange one because like she is fan, ever so talented, um, but I I would like to see her drop it now. Like they 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 tried having an intergender match, a main event, a pay per view with Tessa against Sammy Callahan. A few months back, just just to test the waters, get people buzzing because it was such different and it was groundbreaking, um, and it did get the world buzzing. That oh, they actually they actually closed uh, an Impact pay per view with obviously a stellar intergender match and just showed it could pull off. And they then um, obviously then went a step further and gone, okay, well now we'll have a woman win win the championship um, and and it not be gender exclusive. Um, again, it got the the, the, they booked it the best way they could, where they did, to be fair, get the best woman they have to win it. Um, I just feel that with the current crop of guys they've got now, 
it kind of buries them a little bit, particularly particularly the good work people like Sammy Callahan, um, Michael Elgin, and obviously Ken Shamrock, who just seems to have found the fountain of youth, and he's you know rolling back the years now. It just kind of it just kind of buries them a little bit as like legit contenders that a woman literally half their size is um, holding the championship right now. I, yeah. So I would I I think it's time for Tessa to drop it, but I think she's been a very worthy champion though. So, yeah, I, I agree with you on that point with Tessa hopefully dropping the title soon. But, Lucas, you, you have a point about that, do you not? <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, I'm going to keep it short, Josh. I hate it. I think it, I think it does. It, it, it fails on both accounts. It makes the men look shit and makes the women look like shit because it shouldn't, we should celebrate the fact that they're two very different things. Women's wrestling, women's wrestling, it's fantastic and it's thriving and women can be in the main event facing other women. Men's wrestling is great and it's thriving, it's fantastic. And men can be in the main event facing men, but the two together mixed, let's not do that. No, I see your <laughs> point. I think women's wrestling should be women's wrestling, men should be men's. Yes, yeah. I think yes. they should have equal titles, but not the same titles. Um, so, we're almost out of time. So just quickly before we go, I have one question for the two of you. Oh, actually, Lewis, you wanted to mention yes. the anniversary, did you not? I did. Uh, so this coming slam anniversary on the 18th of July. Um, now I'm ever so intrigued by this because obviously what the the uh, the promo package that's been surfacing lately that a lot of household names that were contracts as WWE obviously they've now been let go. Their 90 days, uh, you know, um, their 90 days. Uh, sit at home uh, clause uh, all comes up, I, you know, ironically on the tw- on the nineteenth of July. And what with the prime package that they're airing, it seems like a lot will suffer for TN- uh, for Impact. And this, to me, is a massive turning point in their future because th- they are signing a basically a whole roster of household names. And this is going to be very ex- exciting because the talent that that's rumored to be signing for them will really, I think, will actually propel. Impact are very close number two now behind uh, all elite wrestling at the minute because it just seems like AEW are hoarding talent at the minute. Uh, they've got a lot of talent because you know people are a bit fed up with WWE, and it's now nice to actually see them actually now go to other uh, promotions now. And it's, it's a very exciting time for Impact. And I, and I actually I don't normally watch pay per views live for Impact, but I'm actually compelled to watch this one. Yeah. Um... I am actually really excited for this Slammiversary. I haven't missed a single Slammiversary or a single Bound for Glory since the first ones, which is a little bit worrying. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so if, if, let's, let's just finish up here. So I've got a question for both of you. Should Impact Wrestling be TNA again? I'll start with you, Lucas. No. I, th- I just think it's a better name. Um... Fair enough. It's weird, yeah, it's weird. I, I, I think it's weird because obviously going off like stuff like Progress um, and a lot of promotions over here, which I've had like the name, um, you know, it's just the name, um, I quite like it. And I think TNA, I think sadly, it just links so much to a lot of bad they've done. You know, like the Hogan Bishop era, um, some of the questionable decisions they did when we haven't touched upon on this podcast, but when Vince Russo was in charge um, in the early 2000s. And I think Impact Wrestling just feels fresh feels different, feels new. And the show's called Impact anyway, so I think you can't expunge Impact from them because it's always going to be with them. But yeah, I, I, I actually quite like the name. Yeah, right. So, same question to you, Lewis. Uh, my answer is also uh, no, 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 no more to that name. Uh, and my reason is actually more down to uh, mainly the, the, the angle they're going at, especially with the, especially with the upcoming Slammiversary, it's now just, it's really just have, coming coming across now as like a real fresh start now. And having having and really establishing the impact name going forward now is really, really exciting. Um, the angle that they're doing at the moment with obviously Moose bringing back the TNA World Championship and defending that as a World Championship, um, even though it's not sanctioned, because obviously because of Tessa Blanchard's absence. Um, and what were the rumours of loads of TNA World Champions are coming back? Uh, it, just, it just screams to me the big payoff is if you if it, well the episode that aired this week uh, after Moose had successfully defended his world championship, um, Ethan Carter the third's music played instead of Moose's. 
I think the big payoff with this will be that uh, the end of this, the the end of the TNA World Championship, which was made famous by Angle, Sting, etc., will end with with at that same anniversary with Ethan Carter, who was probably the first real mega star that TNA ever made. Oh yeah, he totally killed like, him. <laughs> yeah, he he was made in TNA, killed in WWE. What a story that is. Very original. Um. So yeah, I, I agree with both of you. I don't think TNA should come back. I think there are aspects they can bring back. Yes. But, and pay-per-views they can bring back, but as a whole, I think Impact Wrestling needs to stay Impact Wrestling. With that being said, if you guys don't mind, head over to SoundCloud and check out some of our past episodes, and that'll give you something to do while we come off air for the end of Season 1 very, very soon, which is scary. Um, but yeah. I think that's about it. I have been Jazzy Josh Porter. He has been Lucas Jackson, and we were Jackson, Jackson, and we were joined by the heavyweight Lewis Barrett. We will see you guys in the next one. Drop a like, comment, subscribe, share, and we will see you on the other side. This has been a Talking Crap podcast. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Comment down below your thoughts on recent episodes, and while you're here why not check out the Science Pie and Stupid YouTube channel? And don't forget to hit that bell to keep up to date with all our recent episodes.